Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak. The, um, the talk I'm going to, oh, can you go to the beginning of the slide deck? That's the very last slide. Go all the way back to the front. We have to start at the front. Um, I was asked to speak about women in space, and there's a lot to talk about with respect to women in space, but I decided that what I don't want to do is stand here and give you the history of women in space. Um, I've been a woman in space, actually real, real, but also in the industry, for about 30 years now. And so what I thought I would do was share some of my experiences with you and some of the lessons that I've learned throughout my career, just that, that you know, life philosophy based, some lessons based on my experiences in training, in the space program, and actually flying in space. So it's gonna be um, a little bit of a perspective talk. And then, um, uh, you know, later you can ask me questions, you know, after the lecture maybe, um, but I don't think we're gonna have time for questions during the actual talk. So if you can go ahead and go to the first slide, that would be awesome. So I was 11 years old when I dreamed of becoming an astronaut. I grew up in a small town in Illinois, the center of the United States, uh, about 45,000 people. There was no one in my family that did anything in science and technology. Uh, my mom was a nurse. As a matter of fact, my dad got his bachelor's degree in business when I got my bachelor's degree in physics. So when I was 11, I really wasn't quite sure how to go about achieving my dream, although I knew I wanted to try. And then in 1978, when I went to high school, starting grade nine, there was a big article in my hometown newspaper about the first class of women astronauts that NASA selected. And I remember reading that newspaper and I actually started crying because it was so important to me to see a role model, to see the pet fact that there was a path there for me to the astronaut office, and I didn't have to try and guess how I might get there. And I think from that moment on, I really um, internalized and, and really understood the importance of role models and being out as a role model and making that path obvious to success for a young person, no matter what your career is, whether you're a a uh, male or a female or a, a doctor or a lawyer, or a journalist, a teacher, or an astronaut, a scientist, an engineer, you know, because young people can't choose careers that they don't know exist. And it helps them even to see people that are like them doing things so they can realize that that's a path for them. And so that, that first impact of role models, it really made an impression on me. And that's one of the reasons, quite frankly, why I'm here in Israel this week for Space Week, because I really think it's important to go out and talk to students and show them the possibilities of what they can be. I decided to study physics because I didn't know engineering existed. <laughs> I had no clue. And I was originally going to go through uh, physics all the way to my doctorate. And then I got to college, and I discovered engineering. And it was sort of a light bulb and go, oh, you can take the physics and do something with it and make things. And, and really, my whole career was all about uh, uh, my horizons getting more and more broad as I had more and more experiences. I went out to work. I discovered the field of material science, got curious about it, and that's what I got my PhD in. At NASA, I was able to work uh, internationally on the space station program, and that changed my perspectives of a life. So really, the idea of continuing broadening your horizons and continuing to find ways to broadening the horizons of young people so that they can make choices out of um, knowledge and not just sort of bumble around, it's really, really very important. So what you do is very, very important. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that I get asked by students, um, and one of the things that I asked when I was trying to be an astronaut is, you know, how do you decide what your path should be? How do you decide how you should you know, achieve your goals? And the most important thing that I tell people is it's really important to follow your passion. And any astronaut actually will tell you this, because if you're following your passion and you're following your interests, if you're following your curiosity, you're going to have fun. And your job isn't going to be a job. It's going to be an experiment. It's going to be a discovery. It's going to be satisfying your curiosity. And we spend so much of our life working that it's really important that you're doing something that you're passionate about and that you're having fun. Now, interestingly enough, I, when I left the astronaut office, I was in this position where I had really done the thing that I was passionate about. And so now I'm in a position where I'm trying to redefine what my next passion's going to be or what my next you know, curiosity-seeking 
uh, experiment's going to be. And I don't have the answer to it yet, but I, knowing how important it is to follow my passion and follow my interest, that's how I'm going to find my next path in life. Uh, next slide, please. Academics. You know, when you ask astronauts what really the most important thing is that they've learned in their career, what the most important traits are that they've had to, um, you know, the, the attributes that they need, it really is all about a love of learning. And that can be academics or experimentation, but when you show up in the astronaut office, it's really all about learning. We have to learn so many different things. We learn about the shuttle, we learn about the station, we learn about robotics, we learn about spacewalking, we learn about photography, we learn about public speaking, we learn about medical, um, emergency medical technician and, and paramedic um, types of activities, we learn the Russian language, we learn life sciences. I mean, it's, it's just this constant, we learn how to work in different cultures. Uh, it's this constant love of learning that you bring to the job that allows you to excel. And that's really, especially today, true of any one of our lives, no matter what we do for a living, because the world is changing so fast. And there are new fields being created, there's new intersections of fields, there's um, technology that's allowing us to um, meet people that we never before have met. And so this idea of constantly learning and having a love for that will really allow you to, to excel. So when I talk to students as well, I really try and emphasize how much they should develop a love of learning and how fun it is, is to be a lifelong student. I really have felt like I've been a lifelong student. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing that journey. Next slide, please. Next, yeah. The other thing that's really important, and this is, is it's sort of ironic, because when you're an astronaut, it's sort of a vocation, and it's a lifestyle, and it really consumes all of your time. But it really is important to balance work and play. And sometimes we forget that when we're passionate about something, and we really want to dive into it, and we want to spend all of our time on it. But it's really important to remember to draw back a little bit and balance that. By the way, that stack of books that you see me, that's the stack of materials that was waiting for me at NASA when I showed up as an ASCAN for basic training. So that was our, our two years of, of materials right there. But it, it is really important to balance work and play and, and work, you know, work hard, play hard, and don't forget to develop other hobbies and other interests so that you don't become a one-dimensional person. You have to be able to develop all of yourself. And so that's something that when we're following our passions, it's easy to forget. So remember to balance work and play. Next slide, please. One of the things that's really important in life that we learn in the astronaut office is about leadership and followership. When you design a crew, for example, a shuttle crew, we all have specific tasks that we are the main person for. So for example, I tended to be the robotics person and the logistics person, because I'm very organized. And so when we were on the mission and we were doing robotics, I sort of became the leader and directed everybody on how we were doing these tasks, even though the commander was in charge of the mission. And so when you're an astronaut and you're working really on any kind of team, whether it's a science team or a, a business team, a sports team, the ability to flow back and forth between being a, a good leader and then knowing when it's time to be a good follower is a very, very important and powerful skill because it allows the team to function very, very efficiently. Sometimes people get caught up in the fact that, oh, I need to be the one to be in charge. And that's not necessarily the most important thing. I tend to have a, a philosophy that when I come together in a group, if it looks like someone is, is taking charge and they're leading the group in the direction that we need to go, I will kind of sit back and follow, but if it looks like there's a little bit of disorganization and chaos and there, there needs to have a voice, I will step up and try and contribute, uh, you know, asking questions and, and trying to get the group organized. So having that ability to go back and forth between being a leader and, and being a follower is very important because you can lead a group and lead a team from really any position on the team. Because when you form a team and you're really operating effectively as a team, you are using the skill sets of everybody in the team to their maximum advantage. Because no matter who you are or where you come from, you are bringing something positive to that team. And an effective team will figure out how to use your good skills to the advantage of everybody. 
And so when you're in a team, and this is something, again, I talk to students about, when you're in a team environment, you know, just talk to each other and figure out maybe some, you know, you're, someone's good at art, someone's good at writing, someone's good at computers, someone's good at organizing, and figure all that out and, and understand how to bring the team together in a really positive way. Next slide. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned, I'm keeping track of my time here. One of the things that I mentioned is my whole life has been this journey about having a broader and broader sense of experiences and having that journey has allowed me to change my perceptions about life. So for example, um, I did not get on an airplane until I was 21 years old, which is kind of ironic considering that 15 years later I was in space. Um, <clears throat> But as I traveled around the world, when I, I went to England uh, uh, for the first time, that was my first trip outside the United States, and I remember being very nervous because it was a completely new environment. It was kind of sort of the English language, but not really. Um, and I was really a little bit afraid to ask questions. I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an introvert by nature, actually. And so it took me a little while to get comfortable. But the more and more I traveled, the more I realized that you know, we share common traits all over the world. You know, I, I have a picture here of a toilet from China because it's interesting that even, even though we have, a lot of, we have a lot of commonality as human beings, we tend to solve problems slightly differently based on our cultural context. So this is a toilet from China, and then when I was in Japan, and I, I looked at the toilet, I was afraid to touch it because there were so many dials and gadgets and icons and things on it, I thought it was going to swallow me whole. Um, and so that really gave me an appreciation for the diversity of our experiences as humans and, and how much richness that adds to our problem solving if you can get a lot of diverse people in a room together. The other thing I realized as I was traveling and, and broadening my horizons and, and having greater experiences was that sometimes as humans we take things for granted. Of course, this is especially true when you leave the earth and you look down on it, and I'll come back to that, but the first time I went to England, you know, I was looking for a place to fill my water bottle and I realized that in the United States where we have water fountains everywhere, um, where you get free, clean, good, potable water. This was not the case all over the world, and that came as a shock to me. And when I came back to the United States, I really enjoyed going to a water fountain and no longer took that for granted. Here, so, for example, here in Israel, I spent the day in Jerusalem, amazing, so much incredible history, thousands upon thousands of years of it. And I, I bet a lot of people in the country don't go visit those historical sites so often because they're in your backyard and they're always there. And so you take it for granted, right? It's just natural human nature. And so leaving the planet, of course, you, and, and I'm sure Garrett, if, uh, when he talked earlier, if you've talked to any astronaut from any country who's flown at any moment, will tell you that our experience of the Earth changes because we're outside of the planet and we're looking down on it and we see it differently and we realize that we shouldn't take the planet for granted. And so it's interesting as you chart your life and you have different experiences, how much that can change your perception. And it's really important to notice those things and not take those perception change for granted either. And I really feel lucky that I've been able to leave our planet and look down on it and realize what a special place it is, how beautiful it is, how fragile it is, and how connected we all are on the planet. And I think that's one of my biggest perception changes that I've had in, in my career. Next slide, please. Human adaptability. This is another thing. There, another thing that I, I would like to emphasize in my journey, and this again is something I talk to students about, is there's a big difference between intellectual knowledge or knowledge that you learn through reading and, our, and experiential knowledge, which is knowledge that you gain by having an experience, which is why hands-on learning for some students is so important, because that's a, the kind of learning that you can internalize much more. In my case, you know, the, in the case of the Earth, right, we all understand that the atmosphere is very thin, and you can do the calculations, if you choose to, to describe the, how thin the atmosphere is, but when you are outside the planet and you're looking down on the planet and you see that very, very thin eggshell layer of air on the planet, it's like, wow, our atmosphere is really thin. We really have to take care of it. And so there's a big difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge. And so another thing that I experienced um, that everyone here in the room understands is how adaptable we are as human beings. You can see so many places on the planet that people are living 
and they've adapted into these very, very different environments, um, creating very, very different ways of life. I experienced that by going to space. It's a completely different environment, and as a rookie, you're very worried about your first flight because you really need to perform the minute you get to orbit because the shuttle missions were so incredibly busy that if you were sick or if you didn't adapt quickly, you were going to be behind on your timeline and thousands of people were counting on you to get your job done. And so we all worry about adapting to, to zero gr gravity. And it was shocking to me how fast you really do adapt. In a day, it felt very normal to float. It felt very normal to be able to put my body into all kinds of different positions. After, and when I was living on the space station, after a month or two, it was a whole nother level of ad adaption where it was normal to see the Earth go by. It was normal to have every 45 minutes a sunset or a sunrise, to the point where I, all, I really forgot about looking out the window for about a couple weeks, and then I stopped one day and I said, Sandy, this is not normal. You're living in a tin can full of air, floating above the Earth, you need to make sure you take advantage of the moment. Because I had normalized, I had adapted so much to the environment that it was just my life. It's kind of we get into a rut in our lives, right? So I got into a rut up on the space station. And it really made me think because here I was, I'd been on the planet for, at that time I, I was 44 when I flew to space station. I'd been on the planet for 44 years and just in a short month, I felt like I'd been in space forever. And this was my life forever, and this is just what you do. You float around, you look out the window, you don't look out the window, you know, you chase things around when they get away from you. I mean, it was very normal. And I realized that's a really powerful weapon we have as human beings to adapt. So you can be confident that no matter what situation that you get into, you will adapt to it and you will survive. However, let's look at the other side. As I started thinking about this power that we have to adapt, I realized that can also explain why people adapt and normalize into very negative situations. Because we have this power to adapt, and you find yourself in a bad situation, and you quit questioning that that's really OK, because you're adapted to it. And so it's a powerful weapon for good, and it's a powerful weapon for you know, not so good. And so it's good to, again, think about your everyday life. Don't take things for granted. Try and be mindful of, of what you're doing and the situation that you're in so that you don't necessarily use the power of adaptation to your disadvantage. Right? So that was a really interesting observation that I gathered. It's like, wow, this is, this is an incredible power that we have. Next slide. OK, this is going to be my last slide because I'm already down to two minutes. So one of the questions that I get uh, also from kids and adults is, are you afraid? Were you ever afraid? And this comes from kids a lot because, OK, to some people it might seem scary that you're on this huge monster rocket and flying into space. But for me, it was not scary. It was something that I wanted to do. It was my passion. It was my dream. And I got enough of these questions that I started thinking about what is driving these questions about, are, were you afraid? And I sat and thought about it, and I realized that as, p as human beings, we tend to be sometimes afraid of things like my first trip to England. I was very nervous. I was you know, afraid of doing something stupid or saying something wrong or, or not knowing some information about how to behave. So as human beings, we tend to be very afraid when we're in a new situation, if we don't have any information, when we're trying something for the first time, when we're going into unknown territory. Alternatively, as human beings, we are explorers. When you try a new book, when you eat a new food, when you meet a new person, when you travel to a new country, when you take a new route to work, these are all manifestations of our desire to explore and our natural curiosity. And again, this is something when I talk to kids, I really emphasize. So it's really important that you embrace the unknown, that you don't let your fear stop you from doing the exploration. Now, that's not an excuse not to exercise common sense. But it, it's something to remember that when you find yourself in a situation or you find yourself manifesting some fears, the best thing to do is to go out and get a little bit of information about the situation. Make yourself more comfortable. And don't let that fear keep you from doing the exploration, from growing and expressing your curiosity. And so it's important really to embrace the unknown. And I'm afraid I'm going to have I'm going to stop on that note because I think um, that's a good note to stop on, and I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed the conference today.